end of the Vienna Congress, which we celebrate next year, 200 years of Vienna Congress, and the start of the First World War, and golden the age of innovation, where all major technological tools were invented, telegraph, telephone, uh, and radio communication. Therefore, what we're trying to do today is to analyze this interplay between diplomacy and innovation and telegraph. Now, but before we start uh, uh, discussion on the period after the Vienna Congress and uh, this golden age, let us just uh, make a quick reflection about the previous period. As you remember, we stopped our discussion in the 15th century at the end of the Renaissance diplomacy in Italy. And if you can recall, through Renaissance diplomacy, uh, Italian Renaissance diplomacy, we got heritage from the ancient East via Byzantine and, uh, and uh, Venice. But in the uh, 1454, the French invaded Italian peninsula, and it was the end of the golden age of Italian Renaissance diplomacy. What has happened between, let's say, end of the 15th century and the uh, 19th century in Vienna Congress? There were many developments. First, France, uh, England, and Austria, uh, Austria uh, Habsburg Empire, consisting of Austria and Spain, tried to fight for dominance uh, in Europe. And most of the these three centuries, between 15th and the 19th century, were marked by, uh, by the, their fight. They tried to fill the gap which was open with the end of the Christian Commonwealth, with the withdrawal of the Catholic Church as the main player till the Renaissance in the European uh, affairs. We remember that, that Henry, uh, Henry VIII, at the beginning of the 16th century, severed his uh, links with the, with the Pope and established the Anglican Church. It was later on followed by Protestant uh, movement, mainly in the Northern Europe, and the religious uh, 30 years of religious war. Therefore, Europe was exposed to the big, big turmoils. It was also shaped by the uh, grand uh, Bourbonic plague, which happened in the 14th century. The European uh, population was uh, uh, reduced by half. Therefore, there were many, many moves and many developments till the beginning of the uh, uh, 19th century. Now, prior to the Vienna Congress in 1814, there were two main developments. First was the uh, French Revolution 1789, which introduced the Republican organization. It challenged strongly the aristocratic organization of the medieval Europe and general medieval order in Europe. The second major development was the series of Napoleonic Wars, and the Vienna Congress was conveyed in order to address the uh, what uh, European, addressed the European arrangement after the Napoleonic Wars. Now, in this period between 16th century and 18th century, there were two remarkably important personalities for diplomacy. The first one was Hugo Grotius, Dutch lawyer who basically invented international law. His theory, if I can simplify, was started for sovereignty of individuals. He argued that every human being has a natural right to protect himself or herself. Based on sovereignty of individuals, he then built the idea of sovereignty of the nation and the international law. He is also the founder of the maritime law, where he argued for the free navigation. Here he was, some historians argue, a bit bribed by his uh, uh, Dutch and uh, English uh, paymaster who wanted to have the Mare Librum or the free navigation because they have the strongest fleet. Therefore, Hugo Grotius introduced the concept of sovereignty, natural law, and uh, he is the founding part of international law. On the right hand side, you can see the Cardinal Richelieu, one of the biggest and most important diplomats of the medieval period. He established in the 17th century the first Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as a permanent setup for managing relations. He also argued that the main driving force in diplomacy should be interests of nations, not emotions, not religious uh, uh, devotion, not friendship, but the pure interest raison d'etre of the, each nation playing, uh, playing the role in international relations. Those two personalities 
intellectually, practically, and politically influenced the medieval order and, in a way, paved the way for the Vienna Congress. Let's see. Another important development and the major event, which is frequently quoted, quoted in, the, in the literature, was so called Westphalia Peace. As you, uh, Westphalia Peace in the 1648 ended the 30 years long religious war between Catholics and the Protestants, mainly in Germany. It was interesting uh, negotiation where, with two camps residing in two cities, Osnabrück and Munster. The Westphalia is a German province, as, as you are aware of. Therefore, they were coming and negotiating. They spent six months negotiating the protocol. It was a big, big exercise with the two negotiating parties and close to 1,000 diplomats. Therefore, when we are today discussing complexity in diplomacy, we should probably learn something from these guys. They basically needed some sort of break, both sides, in the long 30 years long war. They were looking for a compromise. And they found a compromise which at that time they considered as just a temporary lull in their religious fight. But they, they didn't know that they were creating history. But what basically they created, they created Westphalian order. And today, when you read the books in international relations, you can find very often references to Westphalian order. We are living today in Westphalian order. What is basically Westphalian order? It argues that states national states have the highest authority and sovereignty in international relations. There is no power above the national states. And this is the basis of the Peace of Westphalia. We mentioned French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. Now scene is gradually set for the uh, Vienna Congress. Vienna Congress on the side of diplomacy and the invention of telegraph on the side of the technology marked this golden age of the diplomacy and technology. Vienna Congress started uh, in September 1814. Therefore, in a few days, we will celebrate start of the Vienna Congress. 200 years ago, diplomats from all over Europe met in Vienna in order to see what to do in, in, uh, in uh, what to do with post-Napoleon Europe. Now, it is a very interesting development, one of the major developments in diplomatic history. There were five major players, Russia, Prussia, Austria, Hungarian, uh, France, and England. Now, it was interesting that France, although it was defeated in the, in the Napoleonic War, was brought on the table negotiating table to the famous diplomat Talia. Now, I will reveal one small secret. Over the next 12 months, we'll be tweeting from the Vienna Congress. We are creating tweets named after uh, Talleyrand, Metternich, and others. And we'll try to recreate how would Vienna Congress negotiation look on Twitter. It won't be probably possible on Twitter because these guys were smart. They, uh, especially Metternich, who Austrian diplomat who ran the Congress, he said, um, forget science, forget too many data, let us have a fun. And he drained the budget of the Austrian Hungarian Empire by uh, basically hosting a close to 2,000 people for almost 10 or 12 months. But the story around the Vienna Congress is simply fascinating. They had parties almost every day. There were uh, uh, mistresses, uh, love affairs, uh, spying, and everything around that. But they created, I'll just uh, try to see if I, just a moment. It is a fascinating book, uh, Rights of Peace, the Fall of Napoleon and the End of Congress. You see, the whole book recalls what has happened during these 12 months in, uh, in Vienna. Now, they created, they basically uh, laid the foundation for the order in Europe, which would more or less uh, success maintained the global peace till the First World War, for almost 100 years. There were Crimean War, there were the Revolution 1848, there were small Russian, Chinese, Japanese, there were wars, but there were no major global war till the First, till the first World War. And it is a studied 
as one of the most solid, solid piece. And during the next 12 months, we will be treating and discussing what has happened in Vienna. What can we learn from the experience in Vienna today when there is quite a messy situation uh, globally? The key, two key players were uh, Prince Talleyrand and Clement von Metternich. Talleyrand, French leading diplomat, and Metternich. The uh, Austrian. And there's a famous story that when Metternich heard the news uh, that uh, Talleyrand passed away, that he expired, uh, his first re uh, reaction was, what does he want to say with this? And the guy just, just died. Okay, now on technology side, we had the first invention of the Chapelle's mechanic telegram during the French Revolution. And again, military drive, the need to communicate, inspired the uh, chapelle to create the first mechanic telegraph, which consisted on many towers, which were basically uh, conveying the message from Paris to different parts of the, of the French, French Empire. And that was the first military use. It was used mainly for military. Uh, then it was uh, used for business when they realized that this is a good tool to get information faster than others, which happened later on with telephone, internet, and other tools. Uh, there was an interesting parallel, like at that time, French were the first to invent the new tool. It happened later on with Minitel. You may recall that Minitel was early internet, which had more or less all functions and the internet. It existed in France in the 70s but it uh, couldn't take off as a new communication tool. After the chapelle, the electric telegraph was invented. And here is a quote by uh, Robert Sabin, the electric telegraph did not, strictly speaking, have an inventor. It grew little by little towards perfection with each inventor adding his bit. Now, if you check, uh, Russian encyclopedia, the inventor of the internet is Pablo. If you check Italian, it is uh, uh, Volta American, it is uh, Morse, and uh, there is a whole, whole confusion. Here is the more or less timeline of the, of the, how the electric telegraph came into the function from the first design till, till uh, invention. The key element in here, like with the internet, is this transition from the technological invention which was done by French, uh, French scientists and European scientists and its utilization. Like with the internet, the concept of the internet was invented by, uh, the, by uh, uh, Poussin, the French scientist, packet switching network. But again, commercial use was mainstream in the case of Telegram by, by British uh, entrepreneurs. And in the case of the internet, it was, as we know, done in Silicon Valley. It is an interesting historical parallel. What has happened with the telegraph? First, it split it for the first time, communication and transportation. But we can argue the smoke signals were maybe the, the first one, but in the modern era, for the first time, if you wanted to deliver the message, you didn't need to travel by car, carriage, or by horse. It was possible. It influenced strongly the spatial and temporal impact of, of society. It is even seen in the, in the dilemmas of the name. Chappelle, when he invented, he wanted to call it tachygraph, arguing that it is basically reducing the time. At the end, it became telegraph, tele, uh, implying the space. It also telegraph influenced the internationalization of economic, economic activities. The, like every technology, it brought winners and losers. For example, uh, Rothschild complained that he lost communication Monopoly because he has the fleet of the pigeons, carrier pigeons, which gave him the advantage in dealing with the, with the local market. But with Telegraph, he lost that uh, uh, advantage. He was a technophobe. Uh, why uh, he, but that sounds quite, quite familiar. And I was thinking of him during my summer break when the Rothschild said, the Telegraph meant that even when we went to take the waters for his, uh, for his summer holiday, there was no respite from the business. One has too much to think about when batting, which is not good. That's, that's what happened 
these days with us and then the internet. I'll send you the good uh, cartoon about uh, holidays in the internet era. Another side effect of the development of the telegraph was the emancipation of, the, of women. Women started working as the telegraph operators. So secure job provided greater rights, possibility of education. As you can see here, the, the supervisor in telegraph exchange is checking the length of the skirt of a female employee. That was the hidden but far-reaching impact of the telegraph, emancipation of women. There were many techno uh, skeptics. We saw what uh, Rothschild thought about the telegraph, but Tsar Nikola I considered it a subversive technology because uh, it was challenging the social and economic order of, the, of Russia. And he even declined an offer by Morse to develop the country's first line. As a result, Russia lost the, the technological edge and uh, started and entered, for example, the First World War unprepared when it comes to communication. We had techno-pessimists. On the other side, we had techno-optimists. And here is British ambassador in the uh, United States saying, when, what can be more likely to affect peace than a constant and complete intercourse between all nations and individuals in the world? Steam power was the first olive branch offered to us by science. Then came a still more effective olive branch, this wonderful electric telegraph, which enables any man who happens to be within reach of a wire uh, com uh, to communicate instantaneously with his fellow men all over the world. Now, we can see what happened between 1858 and our time and what carnage we experienced during the first, second world war and quite brutal 20th century. And probably one message that we can draw from that, this techno-optimism, is that technology cannot uh, make the world more peaceful. There is a need for much more. And the fact that we can communicate is not sufficient to make more harmonious relations in modern society. Telegraph created also geostrategy. Suddenly, Britain uh, find Telegraph as the nerve system for the empire. And as you can see from these statistics, there was a huge monopoly of the British uh, telecom operators and later on supplemented by emerging US economic and uh, telecom power. What is very interesting is that today's internet communication follows more or less the patterns of, uh, of uh, telegraph communication. The major change started happening with development of East Asia, Chinese and Japanese, and East Asian markets. But till, let's say, five or six years ago, this was more or less the picture that you can just copy and see uh, the internet communication. Things, ha things haven't changed substantially. What were reasons for the British monopoly? Need to connect the re remote colonies, control of seas, uh, the, high, the high cost of development and maintaining its telegraph network is partly compensated with commercial traffic. The main strategic telegraph outpost coincides with the main trade route, Gibraltar, Malta, Cyprus, Alexandria, Aden, Singapore, and Hong Kong. And it was the main channel of telegraph communication for a long time. What was the really, what we can learn from British approach at that time? is that they use the private companies to create the telecommunication infrastructure. Germany, France, try to, do, try to do it with the state monopolies, and it didn't work. Obviously, East Indian Company and all other companies who were developing the cable infrastructure had a very close tie with the uh, uh, British establishment. And they were getting the tenders, they were getting support. But ultimately, it was a private uh, company which operated uh, this setup. And it provided early telecommunication infrastructure with necessary dynamics and efficiency. And I would say that even today, when you can see that the most of the internet industry is owned by private sector, we can see the same interplay. The privately owned companies and their close or friendly links with the host government, mainly with the United States these days when it comes to the internet internet companies. But all attempts to create 
counterbalancing power, for example, by uh, Jacques Chirac, when he wanted to create a competing company for Google, all of it failed. The public companies couldn't compete in the, this, uh, let's say, um, constructive uh, or destruction of the existing economic models and introduction of the new economic models. France and Germany initially didn't pay attention, but suddenly they realized most of their strategic communication was basically going through London. There was one house in London, I've sent it link, which basically concentrated more or less 50 or 50% 50 of telephone communication. Especially they realized after Tonkin and Fashoda crisis that Fashoda in, in, in Tonkin in Asia and Fashoda in Africa, that they are losing the, also in the military field because they didn't have information. They started developing their own network. It was interesting that France uh, had special relation with the Britain, Antan Cordial, but in the same time, which was political strategic, but in the same time, France had also, France Telecom Ministry had a special link to Germany. Therefore, France diplomacy, strategic diplomacy was linked to, the Brit to Britain and the telecommunication diplomacy to Germany because they had the same interest. There are a few interesting anecdotes. While they were trying to lay the uh, transatlantic cable, there were quite a few attempts between 1859 and 1865 when it becomes really fu fully functional. Now, in uh, that process, the owner of the uh, Western Union, uh, Hiram Sibley, realized in early uh, um, 1860s, he thought that it won't work, the transatlantic cable, and he basically co-financed the purchase of Russian uh, America, or nowadays Alaska, with the idea that through Alaska, he and the then Siberia, he can create the link to, to, to Europe, therefore going over Alaska, Siberia, Moscow, and then to France and ultimately London as the main counterpart. In the Central Europe, the main, the, in the Euro-Asian continent, the main geostrategical fight, as it is nowadays, was between developing this uh, maritime communication, which goes from Gibraltar and Malta, and the central through the, uh, through the continent, mainly through the Russian Empire, and also Berlin Baghdad link, which was which was another competing line for creating telecommunication cables, more or less following the railway lines. It was at that time the main channel to follow the railway lines. As today, internet communication usually usually follow oil and the gas pipelines. When there is oil and gas pipeline, the company often lay the telecommunication cables. Lastly, Telegraph brought a new diplomatic issue. The first international organization that it, which was established was the, uh, is in uh, holding a multilateral diplomacy was the Inter International Telegra Telegraph Union, IQ, which will celebrate next year 150, 150th birthday. It was established in 1865 in Paris. And the main uh, objective was to regulate uh, uh, telegraph communication between different countries. The main international agreements, more or less, when you really analyze the telegraph negotiation, internet negotiation, you have the same or similar issue. The question of neutrality of telegraph, you have today net neutrality on the internet. Privacy of communication versus the censorship. The rules of different places have been changing, but issues more or less uh, remain, remain similar or the same. Uh, Telegraph was used as a diplomatic tool to communicate, uh, and the first use was on Congress of, uh, in, during the Congress of Paris after Crimean War, when the Minister Palmerston received his uh, coded telegram, and uh, this is the famous quote when he said, my God, this is the end of diplomacy. There was in, another interesting anecdote where the State Department sent one cable to France. The cable, the cost of the cable was 20,000 uh, U.S. dollars and total annual budget of U.S. diplomacy at the time was 150,000 U.S. dollars. Just to give you the scale of the of the of these developments, and uh, there were voice of concern. Therefore, you remember that one British diplomat was very very enthusiastic about the peace, and then the other one, uh, Sir Horace Rumble, said the the telegraph demoralization of those who formerly had to act for themselves 
and they're now content to be at the end of the violence. They complain that they lost their independence as a diplomat. They have to follow instructions from the capital as it is happening more or less till today. There was the evolution of French diplomacy and then we skip it. And there were three important telegraphs which shaped the world history. The first was M's telegram, which basically uh, Bismarck faked the content in order to provoke the Franco-Prussian war, which led to German unification. The second one was Kruger telegram from German Kaiser to Paul Kruger, the leader of the South African uh, South African movement, and the telegram also at the beginning of 20th century create, created a lot of turmoil. And the last, probably together with M's telegram, the most decisive was Zimmermann telegram, which was sent from Berlin to German embassy in Mexico. Why? Because the telegraph lines, the German telegrams lines were cut via Sweden, Washington, and then to Mexico. British intelligence intercepted the telegram, and they were waiting for the moment where they will release the content. And the content was the following. If Mexico joins uh, Germany and Austro-Hungarian Empire in the First World War, at the end of the war, Mexico will receive the considerable part of the American territory, including California, New Mexico, New Texas. Suddenly, one morning in 1917, the content of the telegraph appeared on the front page of New York Times. At that moment, two weeks later, the United States decided to join the Antanta forces, Britain, France, and others in the First World War. We discussed during our last session, important in July crisis, July 1914, before the First World War, were misuse of telegraph between the main capitals added to the confusion and led faster to the start of the First World War. Discussion has been going on, uh, what were the causes of the First World War, and I'm sure that you have read a lot about it. But one of the reasons was definitely misuse of telegraph and confusion that telegraph exchanges between different, different uh, capitals created. What are the main uh, lessons that we uh, can learn for diplomacy? There is a need for urgent replies, which exists today. Therefore, there is less time for the, for the reflection. There is a problem of coordinating communication between ministries of foreign affairs and other uh, uh, places. There is need, Telegraph introduced the need to prepare concise messages because it was very expensive, as we saw from the, for the example of the American Telegraph to their ambassador in France. Therefore, it reduced the context which is happening today with the Twitter. We have a short messages without the context. Telegraph facilitated emergence of foreign policy bureaucracy. France established the first ministry in the 17th century, but many countries established the solid ministries of foreign affairs and diplomatic services in between the Vienna Congress and the start of the First World War by using Telegraph as a major tool. It also led to centralization of diplomacy, and lastly, it uh, uh, made the leaders, which were aristocrats at that time, more followers than leaders. And it was especially clear in the outbreak of the First World War 100 years ago during the summer 1914. Here is how they uh, try to see what is the future. And it was one of the predictions from the late 19th century that they, people will be making telephone calls and seeing each other. Everything else is history. We know where we are today. And this was the summary of the golden age of telegraph and diplomacy, which happened between Vienna Congress, 1814, and the outbreak of the First World War, 1914. Thank you for your time and attention. It's a time for questions, if there are any questions or comments.
beautiful these uh, months. Big uh, uh, regards from Geneva, rainy Geneva, cloudy Geneva today. It is uh, raining. We I feel like this was the October or late October, beginning of November. Have a nice day. Bye bye.